Well, hello, hello, and greetings, International Studies 200 students. Dr. Foster here to welcome you to week four in interdisciplinary approaches to globalization. So this week, we are going to um, have the, the last section of our, our module on histories and uh, diversity in globalization, on diversity in globalization, and, and we'll talk about why in a moment. And we've got a few readings, um, but for this lecture, I'm primarily going to focus on the Omi and Why Not racial formations. Um, but I just wanted to say that all of these readings are fairly dense and complex, so um, they're, they're short, but make sure that you're studying them and, and rereading if you need to, um, in the sense that they, they're going to present some um, complex topics. And so we'll, of course, discuss that. Uh, online, whether live or on the blog this week. So I look forward to that. Um, a quick review. Last week, we looked at uh, the question of when of globalization. So we kind of look back to histories of globalization. Uh, when did it start? Is it a new phenomenon or an old one? Um, and we necessarily went back to the um, one of the uh, kind of originally um, global processes or uh, substantially global processes, uh, imperialism and its twin colonialism. Um, and of course, we'll remember the Baldwin and Quinn article that comes out of post-colonial studies um, where Edward Said gives us this um, sort of maybe shocking fact that by 1914, Europe had colonized essentially 85% of the globe. And so it's uniting it into a kind of violent whole as never seen before in history. And so it's a great place for us to start in terms of the win of, of globalization. And so we actually took both an international and global studies approach to globalization um, as per the course, right? But we also um, delved in a little bit to what I called post-colonial studies um, last week for you. And so given that this week is on uh, diversity and globalization, how do those things connect to diversity and the importance of diverse perspectives? Um, so let's start by giving, uh, giving a couple of definitions. Um, you already know what global studies is. We're in the class. And so where global studies evaluates the global system and all of its related features, qualities, trends, institutions, processes, people, and problems, Post-colonial studies examines the legacies of colonialism and imperialism as global processes, as well as neo-colonial or neo-imperial forces in the present. So we did a good job of discussing that last week and we'll continue to do so. Both fields are interdisciplinary in nature and global in scope, and both share a substantial interest in assessing globalization. But here's why it's important for this week. Both promote inclusive and diverse perspectives, seeking to emphasize shared humanity against racial, ethnic, national, or other forms of chauvinism, biases, discrimination, uh, stereotypes, and things like that. So they both um, promote what we could call a diverse perspective that seeks to, to challenge or problematize uh, various uh, racisms, um, uh, sort of uh, exclusive nationalisms, ethnic nationalisms, um, gender biases, uh, any other sort of biases. So it, it seeks to kind of challenge those. And not only that, but to really understand them because the way that they work historically and in terms of our contemporary world um, are, are both institutional and very complex. So it takes some critical tools um, and critical thinking to really understand those things and, and how they work. And so this week is gonna be very cool because it gives us those tools to understand the modern world and its problems so that it gives us a chance and you um, not just a, a, a chance to understand it, but a, a path forward to solve some of these problems um, that we're facing now, right? And so I wanted to focus on the Omi and Why Not racial formations. And so today there's two kind of big important concepts that you may have run across uh, in other classes um, or that you maybe will run across. And those are racialization and the social construction of race, AKA also known as um, uh, race as uh, the uh, race as a social construct. Um, so however you want to call it. So racialization and then the social construction of race. 
Um, so what I want you to do is get out your PDF. So you have three PDF readings this week. Um, the Black Against Empire, which is great, it's an excerpt, and then the, the Buck. But I want to focus today on the Omi and Why Not PDF, Racial Formation. So if you want to uh, get that out or follow along, that'd be great. Um, and I want to start on page 12. So flip to page 12. And um, this is actually nice because last week we discussed the invention of modern ideas of race and racism utilized to justify the transatlantic uh, uh, trade in enslaved humans, colonialism, imperialism. We talked about ideology and all that stuff. Uh, myth making and so we're gonna uh, really analyze this week how that works um, and how important concepts like racialization and social construction of race works so I want you to turn to page um, 12 and the nice thing here is that she gives us a sort of um, a summary a little bit of a, a summary or, or um, uh, looking back to what we did last week and so the Omi and why not on the top of page 12 state that the expropriate and she uh, uh, the Omi and why not here are are discussing this um, earlier period in which uh, modern ideas of race were invented uh, around the time of the transatlantic uh, slave trade and imperialism and so they say that the expropriation of property the denial of political rights the introduction of slavery and other forms of coercive labor, as well as outright extermination, all presupposed a worldview, a worldview or ideology, as we talked about last week, which distinguished Europeans, quote unquote, children of God, human beings, etc., from others, from others. Such a worldview was needed to explain why some should be free and others enslaved, why some had equal rights or rights to land and property while others did not. Race and the interpretation of racial differences was a central factor in that worldview. So the first thing I want to focus on in that sentence or those couple of sentences is that the invention of race is based off of a worldview. Our modern conceptions of race are built off of a worldview. And we'll remember that that has to do with ideology. And we talked about ideology as being a, a whole set of ideas or a worldview that don't just stop there in the realm of ideas and the ideal, but actually shape action, shape policy, drive policy whether national, individual, or continental. And so it actually has a very concrete instantiation in the real world. So it's not just an idea that's up here, it's an, a set of ideas or worldview that drive and have real effects, drive uh, policy or actions um, or events. And so this has a very real world application in it, right? So it's different from just an individual idea or moral in the sense that it, it, it actually does things in the real world, right? All right, <clears throat> so they go on to say how, so they go on to kind of explain how, and, and this gets us towards our concept of, of race as a social construction, um, how, what that means in terms of thinking about race, um, kind of going away from thinking about it as a universal, unchangeable, immutable, essential biological characteristic that absolutely differentiates human beings into something like different types or groups or different species. Um, so scientifically, we know that that's not the case. Actually, there's a human race, one human race, right? And there, there's, not, there's not different biological significantly different biological categories, right? And so um, to evidence that, to kind of back that up, they say uh, a few sentences down on page 12 that um, physical anthropologists and biologists have abandoned the quest for a scientific basis to determine racial categories. So again, going back towards that idea that it's, or that, that sort of evidence that it has more to do with society, more to do with politics, more to do with economics than it does with some sort of absolute biological or scientific perspective. Um, 
The social sciences have come to reject biologistic notions of race in favor of an approach which regards race as a social concept. Uh, end quote. That's the bottom of page 12. So again, race as a social construction. Um, and then they state at the top of page 13, kind of going off of that, race is indeed a preeminently socio-historical concept. So it has, it's, it has to do with society and the social, but it also changes over time. So it's historical, socio-historical. Racial categories and the meaning of race are given concrete expression by the specific social relations and historical context in which they are embedded. Racial meanings have, a, have varied tremendously over time and between different societies. So there's a couple of important things going on here. Um, one is that racial categories and the meanings of race are given uh, concrete expressions by specific social relations and historical context. So let's under, unpack that sentence. Um, what it means is, is these meanings of race are... Um, given expre concrete expression, that is, they have real-world applications um, by a specific societal historical context, right? Um, so think about imperialism. Uh, meanings of race were expressed through a kind of imperial ideology, right? And that imperial ideology, we'll remember from last week, said that Europeans were civilized and progressed and everybody else wasn't and they were inferior. You had this sort of expression of a concrete idea, and it's concrete because it actually drove action, right? It, it, was, it was law at that point, so concrete. But it was based off of this idea, based off of this worldview or ideology of superior, inferior, and we talked about that. So that's what they mean there by meanings of race are given concrete expression by a particular socio-historical context. So it's all contextual and it's constructed in a way, right? It's produced in a way. It doesn't mean it's illusory or not there, um, because there's, because as we know, something like racism actually has very, um, concrete repercussions. It's very real. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that ideas of race that drive it are correct or absolute or essential or universal. They're not, they're actually socio historically specific. Okay. So let's continue on a little bit. Um, if you go on page 13, and I really like this because this gets back to our sense of uh, global studies and international studies, I mean, why not um, talk about the way that, uh, so there's this idea that because race or ideas of race, uh, both in, in terms of idea and concrete expressions of race, have changed dramatically um, throughout history and from place to place. Um, that that actually evidences the, 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 the this social construction of race or socio-historic construction of race, this, this, um, this idea that it's not um, absolute, immutable, biological, um, and all that stuff that has been scientifically disproven. So this gives us a good, a good tool to fight stereotypes, to fight racism, to fight discrimination. Um, but what they do is give us a, a good example of, of how that plays out in um, specific times and specific places. So we talked about last week how we need to go kind of case by case, right? We had that interesting conversation about colonialism versus imperialism. Um, and we talked about how it's important to have broad conversations and definitional conversation, but it's also important to look at specific situations, specific events, and be able to analyze those too and connect them. And so they give us a, a great idea of the social construction of race. Um, and I'm not going to go over this in great detail because I want you to, and I want you to study this. But on 13, they talk about um, in Latin America, specifically Brazil, how that is, how ideas and um, concrete expressions of, of race, actual race and categories in law are much different than they are in the United States, right? And so if this universal thing varies from country to country, then how is it uh, immutable and essential? Well, it's, it's not. Um, so it's socio-historically specific. So if you look at the sort of last half of 13, they say that um, one of the most striking consequences of the Brazilian system of racial identification is that parents and children and even brothers and sisters, biological brothers and sisters, are accepted as representatives of quite, quite opposite racial types, right? Um, so this is very different from the United States. Um, 
and the United States is very different um, from the way, and they give the example of how it's different from Britain. So they say at the very bottom there, um, in contemporary British politics, the term black is, is used to refer to all non-whites. Interestingly, this designation has not arisen through racist discourse, um, but rather in political and cultural movements, Asian as well as Afro-Caribbean youth are adopting the term as an expression of self-identity. The wide-ranging meanings of black, and so here's the, here's the point, here's the kicker here, the wide-ranging ranging meanings of black internationally, globally, illustrate the manner in which racial categories are shaped politically, right? So politically constructed or socially constructed. Moving on to page 14, they say that the process by which social, economic, and political forces determine the content and importance of racial categories are what they call racial formations. So that's another term to think about because um, it gives us a more complex tool of dealing with uh, reality, right? So they say that racial formation, again, the top of 14, is the process by which social, economic, and political forces determine the content and importance of racial categories. So it's not that racial categories are foundational and biological and essential and Im immutable, and then that is what drives the politics, the cultural, um, the economic, but it's economic, social, and political forces that themselves that determine the content and meaning and importance of race and racial categories. So again, they're constructed, socially constructed. Um, moving on, they then do a good job of kind of deconstructing stereotypes that you've you've heard about race, racial stereotypes, and what and you can I want you to go over these. I don't want to rehash them because I don't want it to to uh, prioritize them. There's something that that we should be critiquing, but they say that sort of racist stereotypes reveal a series of unsubstantiated beliefs about who these groups groups are and what they're like. So uh, what a stereotype does is reveals in the, the haver of the stereotype is an unsubstantiated belief in who or what a person is and the group that they belong to. And it also assumes that um, a person stands for a whole group. So there's all sorts of um, uncritical, uh, ignorant, uh, unsubstantiated, uh, and dangerous assumptions that underlie stereotypes. Um, they are ideolo uh, ideological, as they say here, and uh, we talked about that. They also say that racial beliefs operate as amateur biology, a way of explaining variations in human nature. So differences in skin color and other obvious physical characteristics supposedly provide a visible, visible clue to differences lurking underneath. So somehow your outward experience is supposed to reveal some sort of clue about an essential nature of an individual. Um, so, I mean, that's just as silly as saying, you know, the way, some, the way that someone dresses reveals uh, exactly what they will do or who they are, or where they come from, or, 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 or things like that. Um, so it's, it's fairly... Uh, unsubstantiated as they go on and, and, and say. And so they say that on page 15, the continuing persistence of racial ideology suggests that these racial myths and stereotypes cannot be exposed as such in the popular imagination. So they're, they're so embedded in the way that we think and the way that we go about it. You see them on the, on the media, politicians. Um, they're just kind of presented as almost natural and uh, second kind of like almost um, what do you call it second uh, second nature or something like that when it's actually created and it's, it's not natural at all so these myths um, and stereotypes they say sadly cannot be exposed as such in the popular imagination they are we think too essential too integral and uh, too integral to the maintenance of the US social order 
Um, so they're so ingrained that it's very hard to expose them as, as, as myth. Um, and you can kind of think about that as, as, as uh, you know, we, we get through the, the, the past year. Um, so, of course, it's our job to be able to think critically uh, about these things and try to deconstruct some of the problematic um, some of these problematic uh, racial and other myths, uh, biases, discrimination, stereotypes, right? Um, these and innumerable other examples show that we tend to view race as something that is fixed and immutable. That is, it, it never changes and it's absolute, something rooted in nature. Thus, we mask the historical construction of racial categories, the shifting meaning of race, and the crucial role of politics and ideology in shaping race relations. Races do not emerge full blown. They are the result of diverse historical practices and ideas and are continually subject to challenge over the definition of, of, of meaning. Um, just to give you another example, in United States law, actual United States law, um, Jewish Americans, Italian Americans, and Irish Americans were by law considered not white in the 19th century. And then around 1911, that changed. The law changed to include them as, as white. Um, this is a historical fact, but it shows that race changes. And if race changes or ideas of race and how race is, is managed and institutionalized can change, then it means that race is a social construct. It's not immutable. It's not universal. It's not some sort of biological essentialist, uh, biological essence, right? So if, if one's race can legally change as it has, as it has both nationally here and internationally and globally, um, then it is not uh, universal, right? Then it is not uh, biological because one doesn't just wake up the next day with a different body, right? So race, social construct. The last thing I wanted to talk about today is race, um, uh, racialization racialization. So this should give you, this should hint to you that it's a process, that it's an action, it's a doing, racialization, racial, racializing. Um, they employ the term racialization, and this is the very top of 16, to signify the extension of racial meaning to a previously racially unclassified uh, relationship, social practice, or group. Racial, racialization is an ideological process and historically specific one. So racialization signifies the extension of racial meaning or the imposition of racial meaning, the imposition of categorization to a previously racially unclassified relationship, social practice, or group, right? So it's this imposition from outside um, onto a group of these kind of categories. And with those categories comes a kind of policing almost, a kind of managing Right, so it's a form of oppression, and we talked about how that worked under imperialism and colonialism, and we'll continue to talk about how that works um, this week. But they also say that ra racialization is an ideological process and a historically specific one, and what I wanna do is make sure that we're very clear about ideology again, um, and that it's not just uh, 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 in the realm of an illusion or just an idea, but that an ideology actually is both um, a, a, a sort of a set of ideas, worldview, and a concrete expression of those worldviews. And what we mean by that is that these ideas institute, drive, and shape policy, right? So a, a practice like racial profiling by the police is a concrete expression of a racist worldview. So you have both a sort of um, ideal or worldview or idea aspect to it and a concrete institutionalized and material aspect to it as well. So racialization includes both of that. It's about how uh, race is a social construct, it's a, it's a worldview. You can think about racism as the idea behind it and then racialization um, or the actual concrete discrimination um, as the action that the idea drives, okay? So that is a, a sort of a complex idea and we've covered a lot of things um, today, but we're gonna unpack those over the course of this week. Again, you've got a couple of other readings, uh, the book and the um, uh, Black Against Empire, which is really great. And these are the important tools that allow us not only to understand the world as it is today and it has, it has um, shaped historically, but these critical tools actually give us the, 
the, the ways and means to address and attempt to solve um, the problems facing us as a, as a world, as a country, as a, as a city, as a location. Um, and so it's very important. Please come to our discussion. Uh, so uh, again, for one section it's required, 002, and for 801 it's optional. I encourage everybody to come. Please come with comments and questions, ready to talk to uh, everybody in the room, virtual room, so to speak. Uh, we've also got, a, a, as usual, our, our online um, Canvas discussion that we'll um, also have a conversation and then a, a quiz later in the week. So uh, look forward to seeing you then, and be well. I'll see you soon. Dr. Foster signing off. Thanks.